Hello everybody, this is China Manufacturing Decoded, the podcast of Sophist. And today I am your host, Renaud Angeron, here. And I'll be with Paul Adams, uh, one of our senior engineers who manages some of the new product developments for some of our clients. Hey, Paul, how are you doing? Hi, Renaud. Yes, I'm fine. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. It's going to be an interesting one, I think. All right. And today, what are we talking about, Paul? Well, it's, you know, because uh, we're involved with a lot of new product development and we want to make sure that the products are correctly developed, I want to be talking about the Taguchi methodology. So also known as the robust design methodology. Mm. Right. So it's a topic that I believe we haven't covered in the past. How would you, how to say, uh, summarize it? You know, what, what is its objective? Basically, when a company is developing a new product, why would they have to look into that? In what kind of cases? Well, it, it's, it's really looking at a product that has the basic noise that is influence a signal. Now, when we're talking about a signal, we're talking about an output of a product. Take a, a very basic product like a light bulb, for example. So the output is the, the lumens or how bright that light bulb is. Now, the noise could be static or variation within the, the electricity itself, moisture, damp. We can't control those things. And it's all about reducing the effect of any external noise that we cannot control upon the output of the product itself. And this can be on a product, and it also can be within a process itself, so a manufacturing process. So it's really trying mm -hmm. to get the, the optimum conditions for either a product operation or a process, manufacturing process. Okay. So we're going to keep it fairly simple and not too abstract, let's say, in this episode. Basically, this is particularly interesting when a client comes to us and they say, hey, I'd like to develop this product this way uh, with that type of manufacturing process or putting together, you know, this and that kind of whatever components that way. Look at that. I did a rough prototype. It looks nice. It works nice, you know, and we have big doubts about whether it can be uh, manufactured, you know, uh, consistently well, right? There's some, <laughs> there's, the, there's a lot of companies that made this mistake. Like for example, that, that 3D printer that was very successful on, on, on Kickstarter. Uh, I forget the name, I uh, have somewhere. And they had a, a module that was liquefying the, the, the substance, right, to be 3D printed. And they invented that. And it was very, uh, very nice, very sophisticated. And they made it work, okay? So uh, the product design, was, let's say, was okay to make a prototype, but it just could not go into mass production. They had countless, countless issues. It just wouldn't work reliably, right? So... In this kind of situation, for example, would you say that uh, an analysis based on Taguchi methods would have pointed out what the risk is? And also, would you say that it would have helped provide some solutions about maybe how it could be done, you know, with with, with a certain, um, I don't know, maybe changes, changing the, the product design, maybe changing the manufacturing process so that it actually can be made consistently well oh absolutely i have no doubt about that um you know it's we're looking at the robust design or the Taguchi method is a very systematic approach to the design and and the test mm -hmm. um we, we've got uh, various different ways there's uh, so the hit and miss style testing where we're doing potentially hundreds of hundreds of uh, combinations of uh, various elements within the design itself in order to get to the right output. Now, a lot of people haven't got time or the resources to actually continue 
you know, that type of test, you know, that, that could take potentially years to get to where you want to go. And, and people just say, I'm not going to do that. However, mm-hmm. with the Taguchi methodology, it's very systematic and, and, and you, you're looking for critical to quality factors that you can plug into the system. We're looking for, uh, like, like I said earlier, the, the noise factors that are things that we can't control within the system itself. You plug those into a formula, um, a, into a, um, a grid of uh, combinations. And that gives you the answers very, very quickly. And, and that shows you what the, the, the variations are and the minimal impact. So we're looking at, you know, um, element A. And element B run together, element B, element C, and all of these different combinations very, very quickly, you know, you get a very clear answer to what this is a problem because it has a huge impact on the result, as in a negative impact, or, you know, it's, this is very, very good because it has a minimal impact, you know, so this is the combination of elements of the design, you know, elements we're talking about that could be the, the ingredients. The, the tolerances, the speed of the process itself, um, mm-hmm. all of these factors come into play and it gives you an answer very, very quickly. Yes. Since, since we're on a podcast and, and um, we can really show visuals, I would suggest maybe we take a, a simple example, right? Let's say, for example, looking at plastic injection molding, right, which is a very, very common type of manufacturing process, Sometimes certain types of product design or, or you know component design make it very very hard to get to the exact result that you want. Right? You're gonna take a certain um, certain polymer or whatever, maybe some ABS and PC, and you're going to inject it, and you're going to do a lot of trial and error. Typically, that's how <laughs> that's how plastic suppliers do. They do a lot of trial and error. Uh, they will adjust. The cycle time, they would adjust the temperature, they would adjust maybe the pressure, right? And, yeah. And there's, there's some other elements, obviously, right? And there's some of them that they cannot really change, such as the temperature, the humidity. So that's what you were mentioning. Some variables can be controlled, some of them cannot be controlled. And so they make Correct. changes to certain variables that they can control. Again, the temperature, the speed, the, the cycle time, things like that. And then they look at the output of the process and they see, you know, oh, okay, I'm getting a little bit better here, but uh, okay, it's too hot. So whatever, it bur- it's like burns here, whatever. Okay, I'm going to make it a little bit cooler. Oh, uh, the mold flow is not that great. I'm, I have some kind of um, uh, visual issue because of that or something, right? So, and then they do a lot of trial and error, right? And in, in, in most cases, they kind of get it to work, you know, let's say. <laughs> and in some cases, they don't really get it to work, right? But then what do they do? Either they just go ahead and they say, oop, we hope that the customer will accept. <laughs> or they stop and they tell the customer, hey, we have a problem. You know, this product design, you know, with this mold, with your quality standard, we cannot handle it, right? And you would come in there and say, well, Yes, we know that the port, you know, in this mold design, they only give a certain window of parameters that can really make it work. But there is a systematic way of playing with the variables in a certain way. And and, and that method will give us, okay, this is the window of the parameters. You know, with this kind of temperature, this kind of pressure, this kind of cycle time, for example, it can work, right? And then you look at the window. Is it a very thin window? <laughs> Which means it might be pretty challenging to maintain the process within that window <laughs> in manufacturing. And that should ring an alarm bell, right? Versus, okay, it's a pretty nice fat window. We can handle that. The risk is re- relatively low, right? So. When it comes to the manufacturing process, that's how I think about it. Am I correct? Or you absolutely hit the nail on the head. You know, that's, that's a very good analysis to to talk about, as opposed to show, as you mentioned. And 
you know, you, you think about some of the failing modes in injection molding where you've got short shots or, uh, as you mentioned, you've got burn marks, you know, distortion. Uh, there's so many various failing modes in injection molding. With the systematic approach that Taguchi teaches and, and, and you go through, you plug in all of these variables within your critical control environment and you you put in your different temperatures for example if you want to run hotter or, or cooler you put those in as your two parameters for your temperature some of the noise could be moisture within the pellets or within the, the polymer itself but again it's looking at all of the the machine parameters putting the a, a top and a lower limit on each of those variables Putting those through the Taguchi method, that's going to give you that operating window. And you're absolutely right, Renny, what you said. You know, that operating window could be so narrow that the design needs to change or the material needs to change or something needs to change within you know, the process itself. Uh, on the flip side of that, they could actually show you that the operating window is, is very large and, and is very comfortable. However, we do have an issue going back to trial and error testing that if they if a manufacturer doesn't fully understand the product that you're developing or the material that you've chosen they could be operating within this large area of a window of operation but right on the edge and therefore they're producing parts that fall with outside specification they're outside the tolerance or whatever the case may be and they don't understand why and the customer gets annoyed because they're getting all of these rejected products and says, this is a fairly simple product. Come on, guys, what are you doing? Because they don't understand that they are on the edge of their operating window. Now, if they ran through the Taguchi methodology and they understood what that window was, they could adjust the settings and maintain through a closed loop control system, a very, very good, reliable production methodology. Right. Uh, nice way of explaining it, yes. And just reassure me, I mean, this is, is not all new. You know, it's not like a a, a Japanese uh, statistician came up with that last year, right? We're talking about something that came up in the 80s, right? And do, did, did you have some, um, you, I think you, you mentioned to me in, in, in some previous um, occupations, you've been using this, this method. Yeah, you know, it's... um. It's been around for a while. Uh, Dr. Kitaguchi is a Japanese genius, I think. Uh, he, he originally worked for a company called Electrical Communications Laboratory. Uh, he started there in 1949, so it was just after World War II when the, the, the Japanese were just building themselves up again. And Dr. Kitaguchi, uh, he went to America and, and he studied at uh, Princeton University, or visited there, um, to actually understand what they were doing. He then understood that statistics were a big thing with respect to reliability. So he then went back to Japan, went to, uh, went to work on his new methodology. And, you know, since, uh, basically you're right, early eighties, this has been the norm. You know, when I say the norm is, it's been very widely used throughout the world and to some extent very, very successfully. Very successfully, and so, and, and a lot of the big industrial um, giants of the world have adopted Taguchi because they understand the importance of the results. Right. Yeah. There's so many, so many process breakthroughs. Um, I mean, I just have one in mind because I, I used to know um, uh, David Collins, right? Who uh, in in the eighties was uh, one of the the scientists working on paint at General Motors, and um, they're the first team that made it work to uh, to paint a um, a car body with water based paint, right? And there's there's a, there's a uh, what do you call it a patent, uh, and his you know his his name is on there. It was a big achievement. And GM was working on it, Volkswagen was working on it at the same time, and so on and so forth. And how did they make it work? Well, they um, they used the Taguchi methods, he told me, right? Some kind of design of experiments, you know, that 
that allowed them to pinpoint out, okay, if we set all the variables like this and we, con we try to control all these variables that way, then let's see, it should work, right? And that's how they made it work. And this is just one example, you know, that, that obviously was enormously positive for, for environmental conservation, right? But there's, there's a lot of other examples, right? Maybe we don't need to, to, to go over that, but it's not like we're talking about something that's hardly known. <laughs> it's just not something that's discussed very much. And, uh, and, and, and it's a pity. It's a pity. Yeah, you know, it, it's not a new thing. Yeah, it's not the new, uh, new shiny object. Um, it, it's been widely adopted by a lot of companies and a lot of companies have had huge success. And, and, and what are the main philosophies of Dr. Gaju, uh, Taguchi was the, the impact on society. Uh, and he talks about the, uh, the cost of loss. Um, and it's not just. Uh, talking about the the cost to the manufacturer itself he's talking about the the overall cost to the environment to the society and and everything so if you're turning out a poor product you know it's the, the manufacturer will ultimately uh pay for the warranty if it's still in warranty if it's outside of warranty who's going to pay for the repairs well the customer generally pays for the repairs if they feel that way inclined they may say you know what this is it's broken way before I expected. I'm going to change brands. So what happens there? We're getting now a bad reputation, or the manufacturer is getting a bad reputation. Ultimately, they lose market um, interest. You know, a, a lot of people are moving away from the brand because they're getting uh, a, a bad name, and ultimately, they could go out of business. So, you know, t Dr. G Taguchi was was all about not just looking at the cost of the process, not just looking at the cost impact of the product itself, but the overall length of the product in its life cycle and its impact throughout the the, the, the entire chain of people that mm. touch it. And that really comes back to what we're talking about, making sure that you're operating within a, with, with a safe, wide operating window such you've got that reliability on every product that you send out. And that's really important, I think, from from where we stand as manufacturers. It's we strive to produce the best possible products we can, such that you, know, you as as clients, as, as brand owners, are very comfortable and confident that the product that you're sending out, you're selling to to the clients, is the best that you can sell. So it goes hand in hand. Right. And it really, what I mean, two important things come to my mind here. I want to point out. The first thing is, this should make it very, very obvious. If you want a good finished product, you you need the right product design that goes together with the right process, right? If you, for example, the example of plastic injection molding, certain parts cannot be made with injection molding uh, reliably, you know, or, or or not at all, maybe without some kind of defect. Okay, now, if you get lucky one day, you can make an entire batch. If you're right within that very narrow process window, you can make an entire batch and it's going to be all perfect. And then maybe you, uh, for, for whatever reason, you change, you move the molds to another factory or something. And then the new manufacturer comes up with a batch that has all kinds of defects, right? And they say, oh, we just can't make it work. It's really hard with this mold to make this kind of geometry with your standards. And then typically the, the customer would say, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, this, this doesn't hold. This other manufacturer, they get it all right. So it's not the, it's not the, the, the product design, it's your inability as a manufacturer to do it. Well, not really. But if they don't make some kind of statistical analysis, typically with Taguchi method, that new manufacturer is just going to look bad and is not going to win the argument, right? So it's really, if you send a product design, if it's a little bit difficult to get it right in manufacturing, this should point you to do a robust design analysis to validate that really, yes, the product design is okay, is not going to lead to issues in manufacturing. Did I explain it correctly? Do you agree with that? 
Yeah, I agree. And and it's all about timing as well. I think incorporating a robust design early in the product development cycle is, is better. Uh, well, it's certainly the right time to do it. You know, it's mm-hmm. it, it's no good, you know, designing a product uh, and you believe everything is okay without actually running some analysis on it. You know, it's, that, that is where you're certainly going to run into trouble during the manufacturing process itself. And yeah. we, we see that, we see that from time to time where we, we, uh, we look at designs and we think, you know what, during our design for manufacturer analysis or a process that we're looking through, we pick up a number of issues that the, the design has and, and we feed that back. But again, that's, that's just a, a simple review. It's not really an in-depth analysis of making sure that the product is really robust. And doing that as early in the life cycle as possible is definitely the best way to do that. Mm, yes, absolutely. So I was talking about bringing in the, the, the analysis as early as possible in the product development cycle. And this is for a number of reasons. Yeah, we're looking at reducing the product development cost itself. Because if we're going to go through a full, full blown test where it's going to be trial and error, and like I said earlier on during the, the, the podcast, this could take an awful lot of resource, an awful lot of time. By doing a structured method, we're going to be reducing the time and it's going to be very, very pinpointed on what we're actually testing. And it's going to give us a significant um, amount of time and money saving during that testing. Another another positive on that, bringing it in as early as possible, is we get an improved product quality as early as possible in that design development cycle. The further down that cycle the changes are, the change cost goes up by 10%, 100%, 1,000%. So the more changes you do earlier on during that development cycle, the more cost savings you're going to see from that. Mm. Another one yeah. is product performance. Increase mm. the performance of the products. Sometimes it's always good. You know, we were talking about robust design there's three different characteristic levels that you think about. Yeah, one of it is smaller as possible. Um, now, this could be friction, for example. Minimal friction is better. Uh, the other one is maximum is better or bigger is better. And that could be, again, friction. If it's really important for, for a stopping power, for example, on brakes, you know, that's where we need that um, bigger is better. Or... Uh, nominal is better, close to the to the mean of the uh, the process. So, looking at all these, understanding that is going to give you a better performance in the process itself. Um, and obviously, we talked about time saving. It's going to give a a shorter time to market, and you know, because we've got a robust design, we've done the analysis to start with. We can then move forward with a confident design that we can prototype and test as a complete system and then move forward into production a lot quicker. So a lot of these you know, methodologies are, are, are there to make sure that the product is reliable. It's got an operating window, as in the the, the process itself or the product itself has got a, a, a good operating window that can function well. and it gives you the confidence that you've got a, a robust product. And I think that's where the, the robust design principle comes from. Right, right. Companies that come to mind that have adopted uh, the, the Taguchi methodology is Toyota. Now, Toyota, they, uh, they're obviously based in Japan. They're a big, big company. Everybody knows Toyota. But they used the robust design principles on the on the Lexus on the, the LS400, I believe it was, for fuel efficiency. Another one, this is way back in the 80s when the Sony Walkman came out. Uh, again, Sony used the robust design principles to develop the, the Sony Walkman to make that as reliable as possible. I think I had one of those when I was going to school. That shows you how old I am. And probably one of the world's best-known products is the the Apple iPhone. Again, Apple no surprise here, have adopted the robust design methodology. Mm. 
There's one thing that you mentioned uh, also earlier that is quite interesting is this idea of, uh, is the concept of loss, right? And Taguchi has that whole idea about the loss function. So I want to keep it very, very simple, right? For, for listeners, so exam- let's take the example of the Lego, the Lego bricks, right? The Lego bricks have to fit and they, they are injection molded. Okay, again, to, to come back to our earlier example. And the dimensions, the dimensional control here is rather important because if the pin is a bit too thick or a bit too, uh, you know, if the diameter is the, of the pin is a bit too small or too large, maybe it's not going to fit or maybe it's going to be too hard to fit, right? So just looking at the diameter of the pins, let's say in a Lego brick, I guess most people can kind of figure that, you know, um, imagine that in their mind. The diameter of the pin, there's a target value, right? And let's say it's, I don't know, let, let's say it's 0.3 mm, right? Just an example. So that's the target. Got to be 0.3 mm, 0.3000, okay. But there's got to be a tolerance, right? There's always some kind of tolerance. Let's say plus or minus 0.1 mm, let's say. Okay. Now, in most uh, manufacturing setups, as long as the parts are within tolerance, within that plus or minus 0.1 mm, the manufacturer would say, okay, you know, pat themselves on the on, on the back and say, okay, this is great, right? Even if it's nearly to the tolerance, like maybe everything is nearly at the upper tolerance, let's say, or maybe there's like a wide variation inside, but whatever, 99% is inside, right? But somehow like, at the lower tolerance, some are the upper tolerance, some are around the target, right? The values go like um, are very spread out. Let's say people will still say, "Oh, okay, you know, ninety nine percent is inside. Uh, that that's great. Good job, right?" But Taguchi to this says, "No, no, 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 no. This is not uh, the way to look at it. We should look at it in a different way. If everything is very close to the tolerance." The, let's say the value created is much higher because it will fit like just perfectly like the designer was intending, right? Whereas when everything is, let's say, close to upper tolerance and everything is a bit harder to fit, right? And then if you do that, for example, in a car engine, <laughs> you're going to have some, some issues that the car engine lifetime might be reduced. You might have, you know, it might be more uh, prone to breakdowns and so on and so forth. So this... This is an example. And basically, Taguchi wanted to integrate that concept of the loss because a lot of values are not at the target, but they are like closer to the to the tolerances, plus and minus tolerances. And he would say there's a lot of value that was not realized there. This is not very good, right? So looking at process capability with the simple uh, CPCPK or PPPK ignores that. Whereas the CPM or PPM, you know, integrates that. There are now some indicators that do take that into account. And pretty much all the Six Sigma literature basically, you know, ignores that, which is a, a big shame, right? Is my understanding correct? No, you're right. You know, it's again, it's a, a reference back to the, the operating window. Now, if you look at it, um, if you can imagine a, a, a bath tub curve, graph yeah where you've got your your upper limit and your, your lower level limit you have statistically right some products just outside that right but, but they're, they're not that they're not at the the extremes where the product is failing but they're just very very close to to the upper level um, tolerance or the bottom level tolerance um and they could actually slip through um and that is where we're seeing a lot of loss because you know, it's some of these products won't actually fit together. Some of the bricks won't fit together or they'll, they'll come apart or they'll be too stiff to put together because it just, you know, if you've got one on the, the bottom level and the one on the top level, are they going to fit? Ah, uh, yeah, they probably will, but not perfectly. Right. And this, this could potentially be where you're, you're talking about that, that, that loss. We were talking about the quality loss function because. Yeah, if if I've got my Lego bricks and I'm playing with my kids, or used to play with my kids, and something doesn't fit together, I'm just going to toss that one away. You know, it, in simple terms, 
So you're right. It's, it's comparing to Gucci, and I think you mentioned um, a little bit of statistical quality control aspect. Um, it, it's if we were for combining a lot of these processes together, Renaud, we're going to get an even better system. We're going to get a better understanding of where we are from a product control point of view, from a process control point of view. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of these big players out there, they combine uh, some of these methodologies. You know, they, they'll look at Six Sigma and they'll look at, you know, Taguchi methodology and they'll work together in conjunction, you know, as opposed to only one or the other. And, and that's going to give you an, an even better control. But yes, you, you just summarized that correctly. I, I went around the houses, but mm, very mm. well done. <laughs> right. So how typically, if a product development team doesn't know about the Taguchi methods, what would they tend to do? And what's what's the problem with, with these approaches? Well, if they, if they uh, sort of haven't adopted uh, Taguchi or some of the other methodologies, they would just... Uh, during the, the, the testing process, they would actually have to go through a full, what they call a full factorial test and, and just, it's trial and error. Basically, it's trial and error testing and hoping they get a result that meets the specification or the client's, uh, requirements. Simple as that. Right. It's, mm-hmm. you know, if they, if they, if they don't understand you know, it's if you don't understand any of these testing processes or methodologies, it's going to be trial and error. Simple as that. Mm. And, yeah. and and Which that is, very, is a risky. Very, that's a risky business. Yeah. Very common. Yes. Yes. Chinese manufacturers. Yeah. Yeah. Say, well, Unfortunately, it is. Un- yeah. Very common. But uh, again, it's a very high risk strategy. Uh, partnering with somebody like that. Yes. So they will say, well. Let us try. Okay, let us try. Oh, they found a way, you know. Or they, or, or if they don't find a way. They'll say, ah, you know, me banfa, you know, which means like there's no way. Forget it. Cannot do. Right. Okay. But what what did you do? Oh, we tried like based on our experience. Okay, but do you have just experience, or do you have like a theory of how the the the, the physical and capabilities of the the process interact? With the variables of the environment and all these things, uh, no, it's from experience. You know, they know all that. Uh, this person's been yep. doing that for twenty years. Blah blah blah. And when when we hear that, it's like mm, okay. I mean, there is some value in trying that. If doing an experiment is very fast and um, and not costly, okay. Maybe they do a few shots. They, they already have the the injection press ready. To get back to my my previous example. Uh, the, the mold is hot and everything. It's it's the, the the whole thing is loaded and they they keep adjusting this and this and that. You know every every trial doesn't cost a lot, so they might go through you know dozens of trials sometimes before they get really frustrated. And yeah, sometimes they they find something that works. Right, the problem is it only works today, and when they do the next batch, maybe next month. It's a different temperature, different humidity. Uh, the polymer has been dried in a different way, and so on and so forth. And and next time they put thirty percent of a regrind polymer, but this time it was only ten percent. You know, everything changes. So they basically have to go again through trial and error, because documenting what they did last time is basically useless in their mind. I mean, this is where when it's an uh, an easy part to make, and a little bit of trial and error will always find the right way that's fine no problem but when 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 you can't play this kind of game then you really have to take a very systematic approach and really as as you mentioned before waiting until the part is in mass production <laughs> that's kind of a mistake this should be caught at the feasibility study stage it should be some kind of risk analysis okay maybe the manufacturing um uh, readiness level you know the, the maturity is not really there. We should work on that. We should see, you know, what is what does the process window look like? Is this something that is going to come out nicely in mass production, or are we going to have a lot of scrapped products and products to rework, and 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 and, and so on and so forth, right? So um, 
um, all, all of that basically to say this is something that needs to be caught at the product development stage. Um, yeah. Anything that that is important that we did not mention. I think this was a nice, uh, nice summary so far of what are these Taguchi methods in relation to uh, ensuring the development of a robust design, right? A product with a robust design. Um, I think this was pretty clear. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, th- I think uh, yeah, coming back to the robust design is is really hitting the nail on the head here you need to move forward with a robust design before you you know b- before you're actually spending too much money taking your injection mold i just want to finish off on this one if i can taking the injection molding and assuming that the product's okay and we do go through the trial and error with respect to changing the temperature changing the uh the speed of the uh, the screw and the, the, t- the mold temperature and, and everything like this and and but then finding out that, you know what, we can't actually make this reliably. What do we need to do? We need to change the tool. Now, changing the tool is very expensive. Even a modification on a on a steel tool is expensive if you compare that to a change in the design at the CAD stage. Yeah, you know, I think we mentioned this earlier. You know, the, the the cost of change at the beginning of the process is one. You know, by the time you get to production, you know, if you're actually in production, you need to start mm. changing things. You know, the cost of change is times 1,000. So it's absolutely critical that you do this mm. as early as possible within the process stage itself. Yeah, absolutely. And then <laughs> finally, just to uh, <laughs> to clarify things, there's no magic beans, right? There's some processes, some manufacturing processes of certain parts still come out with 20% defective anyway, right? Even after application of statistical methods, etc. Because mm-hmm. sometimes, well, sometimes the design really want to change. Maybe they say, well, that's what's going to sell. If I change it, the design intent of the product is lost. I really need you to do that. And then the production people say, okay, well, it's going to cost more. It's going to consume more material, more processing, etc. And they still go ahead with that. I mean, Think of uh, cars, again, paint. (laughs) Still to this day, there's like 20% uh, rework on the the paint job in modern car manufacturing facilities, right? And when you look at consumer products, it's very, very common, right? You know, even for things as simple as um, eyewear frames, you know, glasses, you know, frames in metal. The certain manufacturing processes. I remember visiting uh, Luxotica, the, the the big Italian manufacturer. They have a huge facility in Dongguan, and they have some. You know, they have one or two manufacturing processes. They still have twenty twenty five percent reject. You know, it's it's still a relatively immature process. Sometimes there's no good solution. You know, this is like the best trade off that they that they found with the designers and the salespeople about what exactly should be manufactured. At the end of the day. The job of a manufacturer is to just do what will sell, right? And just do the job as well as they can. And you cannot always reach, you know, 50 part per million of defectives. <laughs> this is only on yep. mature manufacturing processes. So with that, I think we can wrap it up. Uh, thanks a lot, Paul. This was a very nice uh, educative episode. And I think you, you already wrote uh, an article on this and, I think you're going to produce a few uh, a few videos on that topic right so that's going to be uh, interesting thanks for the listeners we'll come back to some other topics on product development uh, around around this same topic uh, and as usual also we'll talk about more manufacturing and supply chain center topics all right well you will hear from us next week as usual thank you Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophies Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. 
visit us at sofeast.com. That's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.